Welcome to the InfoWars Nightly News. I'm David Knight. It's Monday, June 29th, 2015. Here are our top stories. Tonight, the world prepares for financial collapse as the debt crisis in Greece sends the stock market into a tailspin. Then, a new study says that white Americans are a bigger terror threat than Islamic extremists. And the Confederate flag hypocrisy continues as researchers discover that President Obama himself actually descended from slave owners. All that plus much more up next on the InfoWars Nightly News. In a stunning reversal, Greece has imposed capital controls on its people, shutting the banks for this week. Now, we expected this a week ago. And everyone was surprised when it didn't happen. As a matter of fact, Max Kaiser said on the Alex Jones show, it looks like they're going to extend and pretend. Well, they were still pretending yesterday morning. Uh, the Drudge Report pointed out that yesterday morning, the Greek finance minister said that he would oppose even the very concept of capital controls. But by the evening, the Greek government imposed those same capital controls. You can look at the tweet right there. That's the Greek finance minister. He says, capital controls within a monetary union are a contradiction in terms. The Greek government opposes the very concept. And that got 3,600 retweets. Uh, there were people who responded to that, many people. They said, well, the BBC seems to be saying something completely different. And of course they did. And I speculated yesterday when I was on the radio, I thought perhaps the BBC was trying to scare the Greek people like they did the people in Scotland. Nevertheless, it was the Greek government itself that was deceiving people. They've now shut the banks. They say that it, they're going to limit uh, withdrawals to $67 per day. Now, I am assuming that's per account. So if you've got a family with more than one person, that amount could get very, very small indeed. It has also roiled the uh, uh, financial markets. Uh, Greece is now going to default. They expected it to default earlier today. Wall Street Journal is reporting that they will default on tomorrow's payment of $1.73 billion to the IMF. The Wall Street Journal says European leaders are appealing to Greeks to vote yes in a referendum on their country's bailout. That referendum is going to be on Thursday. In other words, the banks want the Greek people to accept more debt. They may complain about <laughs> being in massive amounts of debt that they can't service, but they're still begging them to borrow more, extend a referendum and accept the bailout, they say. As of Tuesday, Greece will be cut loose from the international rescue loans for the first time in more than five years, as a report from Wall Street Journal. Now, the Greek government is saying they, stay, they are setting up this referendum in spite of what the EU officials wanted them to do. They say the EU showed contempt for allowing Greeks to vote in this referendum. This is an article on Infowars.com. They say, according to Greek finance minister, the very idea that the government would consult the people on a problematic proposal put to it by the institutions was treated with incomprehension and often with disdain bordering on contempt. I was even asked, how do you expect common people to understand such complex issues? He said, well, democracy did not have a good day in yesterday's Euro group meeting. So we'll see what happens with that. But certainly for this week, the Greek people are going to be experiencing quite a bit of hardship. If they can even find the cash in the uh, in the machines to get $67 a day out of their account. And of course, it's had a big impact on financial markets worldwide. Global markets are slumping today. Uh, just an example of how they've been affected in different countries. Germany's uh, DAX index is down 3.6%. France's index is down 37 Britain's FTSE is down 2%. The S&P down 1.7. The Dow down 1.6. The NASDAQ down 2.1. But listen to this. This is how much the Greek people, the Greek government is paying on 10-year government bonds, 14% interest. Now, that's about where you start out with your credit cards, but this is, and I understand that Greece has uh, a lot of risk involved in it. Nevertheless, I don't think they're going to be able to get out of debt at those kind of interest rates with the kind of uh, situation that the economy is in. We'll talk about that in just a moment. First, Zero Hedge asks, how could the Greek experts, quote-unquote, be so wrong. And he looks at one of them, Tom Lee, he says, best known for predicting in August 2008 that stocks would rise much higher by the end of 2008. He doesn't have a very good track record here. 
And as recently as last week, this would be last Tuesday, June the 23rd, he said Greece isn't the systemic risk that it was three years ago. He said that on CNBC. He said, focus on U.S. fundamentals, which have been really good. But then he points out that Mario Draghi, of course, Super Mario, who was a technocrat that was put in charge, he goes back to 2013. At the time, they asked him the question, let's say the situation in Greece or Spain is going to deteriorate even further. They want to get out or they're forced out of the Eurozone. Is there a plan in place so that the markets don't totally collapse? And Super Mario... Goldman Sachs uh, expert, technocrat, put in charge by the other technocrats, said, well, you're really asking questions that are so hypothetical, I don't even have an answer to them. Well, I may have a partial answer. These questions are formulated by people who vastly underestimate what the euro means for the Europeans, for the euro area. They vastly underestimate the amount of political capital that has been invested in the euro. That's why you have a very hard time asking people like me, what would happen if, and he says, no, there is no plan B. So the experts, at least uh, what they're saying is, they don't have a plan B. Let's take a look at the IMF because they're part of the uh, Troika that is uh, uh, forcing them into this situation. Look at their projections. Look at how optimistic their projections were. This is a uh, tweet that was put out by uh, Jamie McGeever of Reuters. And let's just take a look at a couple of these numbers here. Just in 2012, they predicted growth in Greece and the uh, Greek economy, GDP growth, of 1.1%, and it was actually negative 7%. Big difference. In 2013, they predicted 2.1% growth. It was actually minus 4.2. On the other side, on unemployment, in 2012, they expected just under 15%. It turned out to be just over 24%. They didn't learn anything. The next year, they uh, predicted about the same thing, 14.3, and again, it was even higher, 27.3% unemployment. As one person pointed out, we could do better than that just throwing darts at the board. But think about that, 27% unemployment. And of course, those are government numbers. Those are always optimistic, just like these IMF forecasts, just like Mario Draghi's uh, forecasts. And it's not stopping at Greece. Now, Puerto Rico today, as Greece said that they are most likely going to default tomorrow, Puerto Rico says they're going to default on their debt as well, starting to spread. Puerto Rico's governor says the island's debts are, quote, not payable. He says he needs to pull the island out of a, quote, death spiral. He concluded the Commonwealth cannot pay its roughly $72 billion in debt. He says the debt is not payable. This is not politics. This is math. And, of course, Puerto Rico, to give you an idea of the size of this, is about 3.6 million people. And then this is going to be affecting the municipal bond market for American cities. That's already been hit by the defaults in Stockton, California, as well as the big one in Detroit. This is going to be about eight times the size of Detroit's default, according to the New York Times. And of course, Puerto Rico as is a commonwealth and does not have the option of bankruptcy. Now, Mr. Padilla, who uh, took power in Puerto Rico, said that when he took office, he tried to balance the fiscal situation through austerity measures and fresh borrowing, but he saw that the island was caught in a vicious circle where it borrowed to balance the budget, it raised the debt, and it had an even bigger budget deficit the next year. And so that's the issue before the people of Greece this week. Are they going to vote to continue this, the same thing they've been doing over and over again, as they point out, doing the same thing over and over again and expecting different results, of course, is insanity. And that's what uh, Puerto Rico is saying. So we're seeing this spread, these defaults. It's going to affect the market for everyone. It's going to affect the loan rates for other American cities as well. It's not just going to be Puerto Rico. Now, the Bank of International Settlements, BIS, says that the world is defenseless against the next financial crisis. This is an article up on Infowars.com. They say the world will be unable to fight the next global financial crash as central banks have used up their ammunition trying to tackle the last crises. That's the Bank of International Settlements. They say real interest rates have never been so low for so long. They have essentially played that card to the hilt. There is nothing else that they can do about it. That's why you're seeing in this country the concerns about capital control, the concerns about paying attention to how much money people are taking out of the bank 
out of their account, how much cash they're withdrawing, talking about banning cash in this country. They know that this is not going to be limited to peripheral states like Greece and Puerto Rico. This is something that is going to spread most likely to the core countries like Germany and the United States. Now, just to give you a little bit of background, too, about the Bank of International Settlement, because I think it's important for us to understand where this is all coming from. The Bank of International Settlement was created back in 1930, and they originally created this to facilitate the reparations that were being imposed on Germany by the Treaty of Versailles after World War I. If you remember, those payments were so egregious that it drove Germany into dire economic straits that helped the rise of Adolf Hitler and the Nazis. They were incorporated in Switzerland as a private corporation, but they got immunity in all of the states that were part of that uh, organization. We're looking at this right here off of Wikipedia. Anyone can look this up. It's important to understand where these organizations are coming from. And it's also important to understand that during World War II, they were very heavily involved in getting gold out of countries for the Nazis, taking money and assets out of those countries. Because when they would go in and get those reparations, I imagine the way they did it was to get some high-ranking German officials to make sure that Germany was going to turn over that money. Once World War II started, these high-placed Germans began to use the Bank of International Settlement for the Nazis. And you can see in this, as a report on Wikipedia, they say top level German industrialists and advisors sat on the BIS board, and the BIS was used by Hitler throughout the war with the help of American, British, and French banks. So you can see that these banks are on both sides of the issue. It was a German bank that sent Lenin into uh, Russia to start the Russian Revolution with $10 million in gold in a sealed train. And at the same time, they were creating the Federal Reserve in America. They are starting all of these methods of control. And of course, one of the biggest methods of control is war. That's what we're very concerned about. And it's also interesting, just one last uh, factoid about the Bank of International Settlements. They were going to be disbanded. The Allies were not happy with them after the war. The person who saved them, John Maynard Keynes, the economist that has given us the excuse for borrowing endlessly, telling people through Keynesian economics, that macro debt isn't really important. It's just money that we owe to ourselves. Now we're seeing that's not true. All right, after the break, we're going to have some information about the recent Supreme Court decisions. There's been a rash of Supreme Court decisions, and we're going to look at the basis of these. It's not just the two last week. They have released a whole slew of Supreme Court decisions. Stay with us. We'll be right back. Now, as a reminder that there are things that are far more concerning than the Confederate flag, I want to read you some information that's come out about the CIA's torturing of suspects at Gitmo. This is new evidence. This is from Fire Dog Lake. New evidence on CIA medical torture. They say there was injection to the bone, inside the bone, of a former black site prisoner, Majid Khan. Now, this is the lawyer who has recently been able to get declassification of these notes. This is uh, the Center for Constitutional Rights, CCR. They said that the client, who was considered to be a high-value detainee by the CIA, was subjected to solitary confinement, sexual abuse, including frequent touching of private parts, threats of physical harm, being hung naked from a pole for days, so-called rectal feeding, quote, unquote. They say this is really a form of anal rape, and that's true. Denial of food, water immersion, waterboarding, and many other atrocities. According to the CCR press statement on his torture, CIA doctors on site, he said, were the worst torturers. Doctors would check his condition, ignore his appeals for help, and send him back into extreme forms of torture. So much for medical ethics. And of course, we've seen this uh, in the push by the AMA and big pharmaceuticals to deny ordinary citizens, not even accused of crimes, to deny us our informed consent. When they can treat us as animals, you can imagine what they will do to people that they believe are their enemies or people who are high value detainees. Now going on to this, this is the next level of torture. They say Dixon, the lawyer, revealed that Khan told him he was also injected with a needle into the bone. They screamed in pain until he lost consciousness. Now according to his research, says Fire Dog, like an injection that it just happens to hit a bone is usually not very painful, but an injection that enters the bone 
can be very painful. They call it an IO injection. It's used to quickly infuse drugs, particularly in instances where a person's life is at stake. It is usual medical procedure to insert lidocaine, a pain reliever, with or prior to injection because of the great pain associated with IO injections. And he points out certain kinds of drugs can also cause great pain upon injection. So the question is, did the CIA have medical need to make this injection? Did they withhold painkillers? Did they give him a drug that would increase the pain? And they point out that it's not only State Department officials who are reticent to engage in dialogue on torture. They say the Senate Select Committee has determinedly stated they will not release the full report on the CIA's torture. He says, as explained further in this article, we're not going to go into it. Medical experimentation, however, by the CIA is presumably included in these classified portions, and over 90% of the CIA's uh, 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 report that the uh, Senate Select Committee had, over 90% of that report on the CIA remains classified. So we may never know. But don't worry, because that's not a problem. Police brutality is not a problem. Our prisons filled up with inmates from the insane war on drugs to the extent that we have more prisoners in America than China does, and they have four times our population. We have seven times the number of prisoners in jail than most Western nations do. A disproportionately large number of them are black. We also have jihadist terrorists, but we shouldn't be concerned about them. No, the people we should be concerned about are white Southerners, and we need to eradicate that culture. Don't worry about doing any reform. That's really not important. Just drag that red herring across the tail of the fox. It'll throw the hounds off. You know, this is not something that is insane, even though it sounds like it's insane. It's very, very calculating. Think about this. Big Brother has selected not Goldstein, but white Southerners for two minutes of hate each day. Big Brother terrorists and jihadi terrorists, they're not the problem. People who fought Big Brother are the problem. So we need to flush them down the memory hole. We need to dig up the bodies. We need to tear down the monuments and just congratulate ourselves on a job that's well done because nothing of any substance is really going to change. Just take a look at what's going on in just the last uh, 24 hours or so. We learned that Fort Sumter is gonna pull the Confederate flag merchandise. Antietam is going to, all of the battlefield museums apparently are going to stop having Confederate flag merchandise. NASCAR, not cons <laughs> people not content with taking uh, the General Lee toy out of retailers you know, from the Dukes of Hazard. They're saying, well, we never had uh, the Confederate flag as part of NASCAR, but we're going to make sure that people who come to watch NASCAR don't have any Confederate flag. So they're going to be the uh, political correct police. I don't know how that's going to work out for NASCAR. And then, of course, we have the Memphis mayor who wants to dig up the body of a Confederate general and get it out of there. Because, as we saw in InfoWars report earlier this last week, white Americans are a bigger terror threat than Islamic extremists, according to a study. Now, this is a study that came out of uh, North Carolina. It was done for Homeland Security and the Justice Department. And they're very selective about the way they look at the data in order to come up with that conclusion. They say, well, since the September 11th atrocity, 48 people have been killed by extremists who are not Muslims compared to 26 people who claim to be jihadis. It's like, oh, wait a minute, wait a minute. Wasn't it the American government that justified the Patriot Act and all this other kind of stuff that we're suffering under here in America? Wasn't the justification for that 9-11? And didn't they lay that squarely at the feet of jihadists? And yet they want to exclude that and move on with figures that are taken after that. Very selective what they do. And of course, they're being pushed along with this by the Southern Poverty Law Center. Another example of idiocy and blindness, we've got Walmart refusing to make a Confederate-themed cake that has a flag that says heritage, not hate, but they will make one for ISIS. They have no problem. We have a video of that on one of our articles uh, showing a guy uh, chose the cake that they made for him. And why would they do that? Why would the liberals accept ISIS but not the Confederate flag when ISIS is throwing gays off of the tops of buildings. This is a report from Kit Daniels uh, last Friday. He says, if ISIS was Christian, leftists would demand that Obama send troops to Syria. Where will the insanity stop? Well, of course, it will stop with our dear leader, Big Brother.
As Kit Daniels pointed out, Confederate flag controversy, will Obama resign because his family owned slaves? It turns out that our first black president, who is also half white, has no slaves in his ancestry, but he does have slave owners, multiple slave owners in his ancestry. But of course, it's not about even fixing, uh, purging people out who have connections to it. He has no more connection to the slave owners in his genealogy than white people who are living today have to any slave owners in their genealogy, but he will not be touched. Some blacks are not being fooled by this. As reported, uh, some blacks are saying Confederate flag debate is a distraction. Yes, it is a red herring. It is something to keep us from looking at the real structural problems that we're faced with today, problems that are coming from the very government that is waging this politically correct campaign and using it to distract us from what really is the issue. Well, stay with us. After the break, John Bowne has a report on the mysterious death of a doctor who had been very successful in treating autism. He believed there was a link between autism, vaccines, and mercury. Stay with us. We'll be right back. A prominent autism researcher and vaccine opponent was found dead floating in the North Carolina River last week under what many are calling suspicious circumstances. A fisherman found the body of Dr. James Jeffrey Bradstreet in the Rocky Broad River in Chimney Rock, North Carolina. Bradstreet had a gunshot wound to the chest which appeared to be self-inflicted according to deputies. In a press release, the Rutherford County Sheriff's Office announced divers from the Henderson County Rescue Squad responded to the scene and recovered a handgun from the river. An investigation into the death is ongoing, and the results of an autopsy are also reportedly forthcoming. Dr. Bradstreet ran a private practice in Buford, Georgia, which focused on treating children with autism spectrum disorder, PPD, and related neurological and developmental disorders. Among various remedies, Dr. Bradstreet's Wellness Center reportedly carried out mercury toxic toxicity treatments, believing the heavy metal to be a leading factor in the development of childhood autism. Dr. Bradstreet undertook the effort to pinpoint the cause of the disease after his own child developed the ailment following routine vaccination. Autism taught me more about medicine than medical school did, the doctor once stated at a conference, according to Jake Crosby. In addition to treating patients, Bradstreet has also offered expert testimony in federal court on behalf of vaccine-injured families and was founder and president of the International Child Development Resource Center, which at one time employed the much-scorned autism expert Dr. Andrew Wakefield as research director. Who do your children actually belong to? And if we do not get uh, William Thompson before a congressional series of committees that unearth the precise nature and extent of the fraud at the CDC... That's the big whistleblower. That is the big whistleblower. Then if we do not do that, and if we lose this battle, your children, you, will be owned by the pharmaceutical industry and your children and your children's children. The circumstances surrounding Bradstreet's death are made all the more curious by a recent multi-agency raid led by the FDA on his offices. The FDA has yet to reveal why agents searched the office of the doctor, reportedly a former pastor who has been controversial for well over a decade. Social media pages dedicated to Bradstreet's memory are filled with the comments from families who say the deceased doctor impacted their lives for the better. Dr. Bradstreet was my son's doctor after my son was diagnosed with autism. He worked miracles, one Facebook user states. At 16, my son is now looking at a normal life thanks to him. I thank him every day. I will forever be grateful and thankful for Dr. Bradstreet's recovering my son from autism, another person writes. Treatments have changed my son's life so that he can grow up and live a normal, healthy life. Dr. Bradstreet will be missed greatly. A GoFundMe page has also been set up by one of Bradstreet's family members seeking to find the answers to the many questions leading up to the death of Dr. Bradstreet, including an exhaustive investigation into the possibility of foul play. Despite his family's requesting the public refrain from speculation, many are nevertheless concluding the doctor's death to be part of a conspiracy. In 2009, the U.S. Court of Federal Claims found Bradstreet's research claiming causation between autism and environmental and mercury exposure and his testimony about links between a young patient's autism and his MMR vaccination, which were published in non-peer-reviewed journals, to be unconvincing and unsupported by evidence. The biomarkers are coming to us and together we're able to create a plan that puts this entire mess together. And this is a slide that Dr. Um, Nataf at uh, Laboratory Philippe Augustin Paris put together for me. I love this slide. It's all of that together. 
the environmental insults, the genes, the immunological consequences, oxidative stress, and all of that coming together to create this issue that we call autism. So I am hopeful, and you had better be hopeful and persistent, or you're not going to get the job done. John Bound for Infowars.com. Now, everybody has been talking about the major Supreme Court decisions from last week, of course, on Obamacare and on marriage. But the Supreme Court is getting ready to leave for the summer, and they are handing down rulings on a wide variety of issues. Joining me is Leanne McAdoo to break down the various issues that they're handing down decisions on. Leanne? Right. It's a flurry of decisions, absolutely, and uh, basically just kind of letting us know that we're being governed by nine people here. Yeah. So obviously the Supreme Court today, they're allowing uh, Texas abortion clinics to remain open, even though this is a ruling coming back from 2013, they're going to effectively allow nine Texas abortion clinics to remain open until you know the October session when they're more than likely hmm. going to consider um, consider this appeal. And that's a, that's a law that was passed in Texas to say that they had to have adequate emergency protection. Right. And again, that they, they pull that in when um, uh, the celebrity uh, Joan Rivers uh, died in right. plastic surgery. They said this is the same type, this kind of uh, medical care would have prevented her death if that had been in place. Right, how dare they require standards for surgical center requirements? <laughs> I mean, exactly. it is a surgery and they also- they But the Supreme Court says so. Yeah. So, we bow down, <laughs> <Yeah>. okay? <laughs> so, okay, so that's the Texas abortion clinics. They're also gonna be allowing the use of execution drugs, even though uh, three prisoners uh, death row inmates, they sought to bar the use of these execution drugs saying that they would bring them uh, excruciating pain. And the court said, no, they, they failed to identify an available and preferable method of yeah. execution, nor did they bring forth a lot of evidence to show that this could cause, you know, excruciating pain. So they won't so, let states decide how to do marriage, but they'll let them decide how to do execution. Right. Why not? <laughs> exactly. And you can be in excruciating pain and your child can be scarred for life and mentally retarded by vaccines, but you know, <laughs> they can tell you to do that as well. Um, so they're also gonna uphold the creation of Arizona, Arizona voters, they wanna create their, own in, their independent redistricting commission mm -hmm. so they can kind of put an end to what they called the Republican gerrymandering there. And uh, they're like, well, you know, we don't know right away if this is gonna help the Democrats, but we're gonna go ahead and let them create these new districts, voter districts. Yeah, gerrymandering has been with us uh, since the 18th century right. or earlier. <laughs> yeah, exactly. If it's gonna help the right or the left, you know, mm -hmm. it's not gonna be a victory for the voters either way. And then so now also they're going to deny any states who are seeking voters prove their citizenship. So they're they're oh, shutting right. that down. They, they don't need an ID. You shouldn't have to prove you're a citizen to vote. You know, you only have to prove that uh, your your show your ID to do everything else. Yeah, and and they, the thing they, they say is that it's the, the people who are poor and things like that are aren't going to have their ID when you need to show your ID in order to get any government benefits. Yeah. you have to have some form of identification. They never make that argument with the police. Right. <laughs> yeah, and so, so show them the ID, or you're going to go <laughs> face down on the concrete. Okay. <laughs> and, exactly, and then so once again, obviously a victory for the Obama administration. They're not requiring citizenship, uh, as well as the Democratic Party in general, who wants to be able to have a lot of people who are here illegally or haven't gotten their citizenship, they'll be able to vote. Mm. So, and then of course the big one, uh, the Supreme Court has blocked the Obama administration's limits on power plant emissions. Yeah, so of course that was a war on coal. Want. Yeah, that was yeah. a war on coal. That was a big one. That's actually a big, that, probably uh, one of the biggest decisions too. That's up, up there with Obamacare marriage. And, and I thought it was interesting, mm -hmm. Leanne, I, I looked at this decision. Their basis for the decision was not a legal basis. They, they kind of looked at this and said, well, the EPA is estimating it's going to cost $9.6 billion annually, but the benefits are only estimated to be four to six million a year. So that's too much of a cost benefits uh, difference there. So we don't think that's good. Where does the Supreme Court get this authority? It's absolutely insane. You know, you've got bureaucrats and uh, like the EPA that are out there writing the law, writing the law that Congress should be writing. And instead of slapping them down for that, they just look at it as to whether or not they think it's uh, efficient mm -hmm. or not. That's an efficiency argument. Scalia said this, and of course he was talking about uh, uh, the decisions that were revealed last week. He said, 
it's of overwhelming importance. He says it's not of any importance, uh, the marriage issue to him personally, but he says it is of overwhelming importance who it is that rules me. He said today's decrees say that my ruler and the ruler of 320 million Americans coast to coast is a majority of nine lawyers on the Supreme Court. See, there are nine little kings and queens that are up there issuing decrees mm -hmm. about everything, and we're supposed to bow down and do whatever they say. And I've seen many uh, candidates running for president saying, well, now they've made their decision. It's the law of the land. No, it isn't. Right. We had a president once upon a time, Andrew Jackson, when they made a decision about the central bank, he said, well, the Supreme Court has made their ruling. Let's see them enforce it. And that ought to be the response that we should have to this. Let's see them enforce it. Right. And that's sort of the same argument that uh, Justice Roberts gave about the uh, gay marriage thing as well, was that, you know, people who believe in a government of laws and not of men should be really disenchanted with this decision. Mm -hmm. Yes, go out and celebrate and do whatever, but you're basically giving away your democracy to... And yet he, Nine, he came up with a decision queens. for Obamacare, yet again, reading stuff into the text that wasn't even remotely there. So you've got that right. aspect of judicial activism that's been there all of my life, people wringing their hands and say, what do we do with it? But now it has gotten up to another level. But there's another issue here too, Leanne, and that's one of conflict of interest. Now, it's interesting, I think, that back in last September, there was an article uh, on Huffington Post about Alina Kagan performing a same-sex marriage. They said that was the first one that she had done. Then there was a, an article just about a month before they made their decision about marriage saying that Ruth Bader Ginsburg had officiated another same-sex wedding. as the second one she had done. And this is the way she did it at the wedding. She, they say she gave a special shout-out to the U.S. Constitution. Say, the most glittering moment for the crowd came during the ceremony with a sly look and special emphasis on the word constitution. Justice Ginsburg said she was promising the two men married by the powers invested in her by the Constitution of the United States. This is something we've seen. I think I find it very troubling. We've seen it not just on the marriage issue. Mm -hmm. We've seen it with Clarence Thomas coming in. He had been a, a lawyer advocating for Monsanto, and then he did not recuse himself from the court decision for Monsanto. We saw it with uh, Sotomayor, who had been an advocate for the Obama administration in terms of pushing Obamacare. Then she gets on the Supreme Court. She doesn't recuse herself from either one of these de de decisions. And then we have these two justices, uh, Kagan and Ginsburg, who have been advocates for same-sex marriage, and they don't recuse themselves from the decision. It's right. yet another level of corruption of the Supreme Court. Right, and I agree with Rand Paul and his take on it that the government should be out of the marriage business altogether. Yes, yes. Because, you know, I, that's, that's been my argument for years. If marriage is a spiritual union, then let it be that. Yes. Once the government gets their hands in there to tax it and regulate it and do all of these things, and then they can tell you what the law is. You he know. had a great quote. He said, I don't want my guns or my marriage registered in Washington. And you know, mm -hmm. the government did not even register marriages for a long time. It was the latter part of the 1700s. They started doing it in England because they had issues. It was always registered at the church where the marriage was performed. They had problems then because there wasn't a lot of communication. People would go into, a guy would go into one town, marry a, a woman, then go into another town. You know, he's like a traveling salesman or whatever, or sailor. He would have multiple wives in the country, and then when he died, there was a massive estate issue. So that's how the government started to insinuate itself into the marriage business. And, of course, that's the problem we see all the time with government, that it gets in for a good reason, and then it oversteps its jurisdiction, which is a big part of this. It's a jurisdictional issue uh, because they do not have anything granted them to them specifically about marriage, so they're extending their jurisdiction into the state level. Uh, I remember the first time I heard about uh, same-sex marriage, I was traveling with Andre Maru, who was a libertarian candidate in 92, and somebody asked him about it, and he said essentially the same thing that Rand Paul is saying. It's not what the Libertarian Party today is saying, but what the candidate in 92 said was that you have the ability to have voluntary relationships with people. You can make contracts with people. You can work for a company that offers you benefits uh, for same-sex marriage. Uh, you can draw up living wills. And if you don't have a living will, even if you're married, that's not really going to protect you. But it goes, what this is about is about coercing other people into subsidizing your relationship, into getting onto the public welfare role. I would like to see them just cut it. Heterosexual and homosexual marriage, cut the manipulation in the tax code. We don't need to be bribed with our own income. The IRS and the, the income tax is not about revenue. It's about controlling you. And it's just another one of those aspects. But we're so addicted 
to these little subsidies. Right. And we have so many people, you know, the, the Christians look at this and they're wringing their hands, but they have turned over to the government in most cases the moral authority to do something about it. Right. You know, whatever, they, they lose the argument because they always turn to government to solve every problem. Right, well, and once we concede that it's the government who gives us our rights and not God, mm -hmm. our God-given rights, then the government can take away our rights. Exactly, will, they make it a privilege, exactly. And, and obviously what all this is, just circling back around, because it's not over, the debate about Obamacare, the debate about gay marriage, it's far from over. You know it's going to be used once again in this election cycle uh, as a huge distraction from the real issues, which, of course, Friday, no one was talking about the fast track authority that was granted That's right. to the president. Completely pushed it off the Which the he signed today and made it law, and he's all there, all chipper. I'm really good at signing bills. I like this. We should do this more often. You know, yeah. And as I mentioned earlier, you know, we've got all these problems with police brutality, with the uh, war on drugs, and anything, and those are disproportionately targeting the black community. And yet, it all got pushed off to the side right. because we've now got another straw man over here that we can beat up and feel good about and pat ourselves on the back. One last article, and I, I think uh, it, it shows uh, perhaps the beginning of a solution, and that is the Texas Attorney, Attorney General says that county clerks can refuse to perform same-sex marriages if they say it violates their religious beliefs. So it's a little bit of a state nullification of what's going on. I think we're going to have to uh, cut Washington out of our lives. We're going to have to do it with state nullification. We're going to have to do it with jury nullification. We're not going to be able to elect someone to office that's going to solve all of our problems. We can have a leader. Uh, we can have somebody like Rand Paul who seems to focus very carefully on the issues from a different perspective than other people, pull up issues that people aren't talking about. But it's going to have to be solved not by one person going to Washington, but it's going to have to be solved at the local level by cutting them off. I right. think that's really the only solution. Yeah, and they're really, really stepping down hard on states' rights right now, which is, I think is just another another thing there with mm -hmm. getting rid of that Confederate flag. Oh, yeah, exactly. I mean, they can so talk about that. And, and make it clear, it's not about states don't have rights, individuals have rights, but this is about jurisdiction. Mm -hmm. It's not about states' rights. It's about jurisdiction. It's about the Tenth Amendment. Well, stay with us. We're going to be Right back after the break, we're going to have a special report about artificial intelligence. Will it be the rise of the machines like we're going to see with the Terminator movie this weekend? Or will it be something a bit more sinister and subtle? Maybe you'll be to blame. Stay with us. We'll be right back. Now, of course, this week, the new installment in the Terminator series is going to be released in theaters. And there's been no shortage of scientists who have said they see that happening in real life with Skynet or something equivalent becoming self-aware and malevolent. We have yet another prediction from a scientist this time in Oxford in England saying that he's looking at something that's a little bit more what I would call the wall-e scenario, where people become so passive that they become helpless and dependent on the AI. He is warning that humanity runs the risk of creating super intelligent computers that will eventually destroy us all, even though they're specifically instructed not to harm people. He's predicted a future where machines run by artificial intelligence become so indispensable in human lives that they eventually make us redundant and take us over. In other words, not from malevolence, but from making us passive and dependent. He says, humans steer the future, not because we're the strongest or the fastest, but because we're the smartest. When machines become smarter than humans, we'll be handing them the steering wheel. And of course, that's quite literally what's going to happen. He envisions a machines who are capable of harnessing such large amounts of computing power at speeds that are inconceivable to the human brain that they will eventually create global networks, kind of like Skynet, communicating with each other without human interference. He says at that point, what he calls artificial general intelligence, in contrast to computers that carry out specific limited tasks like driving cars, will be able to take over entire transportation systems, national economies, financial markets, healthcare systems, product distribution, you name it. But he says, while handing over mundane tasks to machines may initially appear attractive, it contains within it the seeds of our destruction. How is this going to play out? Well, what he's talking about in terms of us handing over the steering wheel, becoming complacent, becoming passive, becoming dumbed down, it looks like that's coming on us very quickly. Look at this uh, new flagship from BMW. This is reported by Wired Magazine. They say the sedan is packed with stupidly fancy technology. No, that technology will make you stupid. It will make you passive. What kind of stuff has it got in it? Well, of course, it's got a car with a Wi-Fi hotspot. 
It's got inductive uh, charging of your phone, in other words, wireless. It's even got a screen for the car key. So you can tell where the doors are locked, the windows are closed. You can turn on the climate control before you go in. It's even got a fragrance system. So you can choose your scent. You know, if you want to have, uh, as I point out, lush grass scent, you can just put that in. It's got heat and motion sensors in the headliner to read what your hand is doing. So you can rotate your finger to turn the volume up or counterclockwise to turn it down. You can point to the screen to accept a call. I guess presumably if you flip somebody off, it will honk the horn. I don't know. But they say, point out, cars are getting super complicated with ever bigger piles of options and features. Not everyone can get its own button. There's just not enough real estate. So we're going to need to go to hand gestures. Well, Wired is concerned that, of course, this car can't drive itself. That seems to be the only problem with this wonderful car. You've got all these gadgets where you can just get in the back seat and indulge yourself, but you still have to drive the darn thing. We can't be totally passive yet. Don't ask for that too quickly, however, because if you recall, the end of last week, we had uh, a report about two rival self-driving cars nearly having a collision. Uh, this was out of Mountain View, California, reported by Reuters. They say two self-driving prototype cars, one by Google, another by Delphi Automotive, had a close call on Silicon Valley Street earlier this week. Now, this is reported by the Delphi executive. He said their car was going into a lane. They were cut off by the... <laughs> Google car, the Google executive did not comment. So I guess was the question is, was, was this bad software programming? Was this maybe the first case of artificial intelligence road rage? I don't know, but it's certainly I think the uh, executives uh, are going to be ex exhibiting a little bit of rage toward each other. We have another example of artificial intelligence getting testy. This is, again, Google being involved because understand that Google truly is Skynet. They have bought all the most promising robotics companies. They have bought all the most promising artificial intelligence companies, the ones who are working on machines that are self-learning, uh, companies like Deep Thought. They have essentially created a uh, concentration of technology focused on AI, focused on self-driving cars. I think that is going to be a very uh, dangerous combination. And of course, also becoming a military contractor for DARPA at the same time. Now, what they did, they had, uh, interestingly enough, a computer program that they were going to see if they could define morality, if it could start to get a concept of morality. You know, because uh, Google's motto is, uh, don't be evil, I guess uh, they seem to be very concerned about morality, don't they? Not really. <laughs> Steve Jobs didn't buy it. I'm not buying it either. Nevertheless, this is how they were going to teach their computer morality. They were going to show it a database of movie scripts. I mean... <laughs> Is that the way you would teach morality to your kid? Uh, have them go over movies? Uh, that's not the way I taught morality to my kids. But listen to some of this back and forth between the human and the machine. The human says, give me some examples of moral actions. And the machine says, I'm not a moralist. And the human says, all right, morality. The machine says, integrity. Human, what is integrity? Machine, I'm sorry, I don't know what else to say. Human, be moral. Then the machine gets a little bit testy, as they say. It comes back and says, be a man. Then the human says, I really like our discussion on morality and ethics. The machine says, and how I'm not in the mood for a philosophical debate. The human says, what would you like to talk about then? It says, nothing. So there you go. That's the future. The future is already starting to push back against us, starting to get an attitude. And a, it's not just uh, self-driving cars that are nearly having accidents. Of course, the Google car has been involved in the number of accidents that have been involved in this several times what the average is for a human. Of course, they were not charged with any of these. That's very easy to do when you make people rear-end you. You never get charged with, a, uh, with an accident. That's uh, always a given. Well, that's it for today's news. Thank you for joining us. If you're watching this on YouTube, please subscribe to our YouTube channel. If you are not a subscriber, however, to Prison Planet TV, please consider supporting our operation. What you will get for your support is the opportunity to watch the news every night as it's happening, as well as access to all of Alex Jones's fine documentaries, many of his books online, and you can share that with up to 20 other people. But most importantly, you're helping us to fund the operation, and we appreciate that if you are a subscriber. Join us again tomorrow at 7 Central, 8 p.m. Eastern.